this is a big deal. Like, I don't know if you guys know, but before on Fridays, we were kind of like, what do we, how do we think about chapel? And then Mike came in with this podcast chapel live interaction thing. And it's huge. I, as your friend and colleague, I'm super proud of you. And it's a huge honor. To Thanks be here for saying today. that. Yeah. Thank you. And Chad is, thank you. Chad is one of my best friends here. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Hey, we want to learn from you, though, okay? So, Chad, hey, you know, um, you have worked with college students for a long time. You were a college pastor at a local church, Mm -hmm. and now you work with college students, obviously. What do you notice about college-age students and their spiritual formation? Mm. Yeah, when I started here, my title was, I was the director of spiritual formation. (laughs) And that felt so intimidating, like I had Jedi mind tricks or something like, grow, you know, like... (laughs) uh, what do I notice about their formation? I, I would simply just say that I, I think you all defy a rule. Like this is who you are and how you grow. Uh, I think when I perhaps wanted to start working at Biola, I, I really wanted to make sure that I was uh, coming because I felt like I went to Biola and I knew I know what it's like. And so I can mm. just sort of project that onto all of you. And over time, I've been really humbled by that. I can see, oh no, you guys have your own diverse stories and you've got your own things going on and you're growing in your own ways. But I I can say the one thing that I have offered and have noticed that people have sort of clung on to and been like, I see that part of your story, Chad, and that's part of my story, Mm. is when I share the parts of my story where I start talking about how uh, in my own personal growth, I have often found that I have been the person who has wanted somebody to be walking with me. Yeah. And, and sort of what follows that is that I, wa- I would want somebody to be approving of me too. Mm. And, and I was, I've really lived a lot of my life, I think, and, and right through college, where I was kind of like hoping that somebody was seeing me, walking with me, kind of showing me how to be a person, how to grow, how to be formed in, in the spirit. And, and I just, I felt a lot of times like I was pretty much alone in some of those things. Yeah. And so the question is, do, does anybody see me? Is anybody proud of me? Mm. Often for me went unanswered. And that was a pretty rough thing. I, um, there was a book that Donald Miller wrote about fatherhood. And uh, in the version I read, it was called To Own a Dragon. And he talks about these elephants and how adolescent elephants growing up, um, oftentimes when they hit adolescence, they need to have a guide elephant come alongside them because yeah. elephants have all this strength right. and, and they need to be shown how to channel their strength and become you know, a full-fledged contributing elephant. Right. And, and, uh, and oftentimes because of poaching and whatnot, many of these elephants were going unguided. And so they were growing up through their adolescence and they were changing, but they had no guides. And so what was happening is they were turning all of that elephant strength on themselves, on their communities, and they were hurting people. And I think I so deeply identified with that feeling of like, all I want is to be shown how to be. Yeah. And, and very few people have done that. And so when I tell stories about that, I have noticed that students go, yeah, that's me too. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah, thanks for bringing up elephants, because I, I see you and I think <laughs> elephants Absolutely. all the time. So. I'm a big guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, we call you Chad and Dad around here, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of times um, fathers are there to be the, the older elephant, let's say. Yeah. What has your relationship with your father been like? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would say my relationship with my dad um, was hard for me to discern how it was. When you ask how is that, for a lot of years, I, I would have said, I think it's fine. And, and my dad is a, is a good man. He, he was a good father. Um, we have gotten close and talked about these things yeah. more as I've gotten older. Yeah. But there was just not a heart connection with my dad and I. He was providing. He was loving. He would say words of affirmation. But what I felt like from my dad was that he was kind of generally a loving dad. Mm -hmm. But when it came to things about me that were specific, Mm. specific gifts or like, hey, you know, son, I see this in you and I know that God built you this way that's particular to you. Mm. Um, Those are words I just longed to hear from him. Mm. But he was at my baseball game and he was always like, hey, I love you. And I was kind of like, that's super great. Thank you. What do you love about me? Right. And in particular, like, uh, or, or oh, oh, good, you see gifts in me, but like, like, tell me about that, because I'm questioning myself, and I really need that guide to come alongside of me. And so there's that 
physical presence right. versus sort of emotional presence. And I didn't have a lot of emotional presence. And so I felt like I was wandering quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So how did that relationship with your dad and how did that affect your relationship with your heavenly father? So mm. usually our caregivers kind of help reflect what it is like to relate with God. So how did that work for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so dad loved me generally. Yeah. When I sit in rooms like this, I can feel the general love of God. Mm. I feel like we as a community have been saved and I, I, I praise God for that. I, I feel like um, that God's love rests on us. Uh, but then there's times in these settings where I'm sitting there and I go, and, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit climbs through all the little walls I have up and goes, oh, hey, also, I, I love you. Mm. And I love this part about you. Wow. And I, I was watching you the other day and there was this thing you did and it was so you and it was so connected to who I made you to be. Mm. And, and like I'm sitting there in worship and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, just a second here. Like all of a sudden it's like quickly gets emotional for me because I, I'm almost caught off guard at how personal uh, God wants to be. James Houston talked about how God's love particularizes us. Mm. And, and so the general love of God, I'm like, yeah, we got this. I'm good. Right. But there's this particularizing motion of God and his love for us. Yeah. And it catches me off guard sometimes, and it's not the easiest thing for me to slide into. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes I, I'm in a big sort of like pile of tears pretty quickly because I see his intention towards that particularizing of who I am. And it's, it's kind of hard to get there sometimes. No, I love that. I love this idea that we have this general knowledge of God, but this particularization of God in my heart. Yeah. How does that work and what does that look? How do we bring this knowledge of God in our head, this general stuff, into the particularness of our heart? Man, I, it's, that's a journey, I, and I'm on that journey. I'm not done with that journey. I think oftentimes because I've been in that seat the assumption that's being made is that the people that are up here are the ones that have figured it out. And I'm on that journey. I'm figuring it out. I'll, I'll let you know as I go. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that becoming aware of the difference between uh, what has been called a God concept versus a God image mm. has been huge for me. That's In good. other words, sometimes I attack my spiritual growth with pouring in more knowledge of what God is up to. Kind of like a God, that's a God concept. That's a God right? concept, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we're at Biola, we, we're, we're nailing the God concept thing. Mm -hmm. But then it's that experience based on my experience with other people like my dad, mm. other primary caregivers. Depending on how those relationships went, I will often project those experiences onto God. Mm. And in prayer, I find that those experiences are oftentimes more persuasive to my heart, unfortunately, because my dad yeah. is not a good example. As a father of myself, I am not a good example of God mm. to my children. I try my best, but I, I fall short, obviously, and I, I really project a lot of that stuff onto him. Great, so you are Chad's dad. I'd love <laughs> to hear how you try to be that kind of father to your children, too. Yeah, man, I, well, I think right off the top, I, I absolutely think about, um, my role as that. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when I was raised, uh, my spiritual growth path was laid out for me and it was through learning all the Bible stories. Right. You know, going to church a lot and, and that's certainly good mm -hmm. and that's important for us to have that God concept kind of growing. But uh, I have think as a dad, I have accepted my role um, as the former of their God image. Mm. I just sort of stepped into that role. So Bible stories are less important to me. Sometimes I come through and I'm like, you know, Noah, right? Two by two. And my kids are like, <laughs> wait, what are you talking about, Dad? I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm behind on the God concept thing mm -hmm. because I'm embracing the fact that I'm going to form their image of God. Mm. And uh, I, I really, I, you see this in Job a little bit. Uh, Job was this guy who had this concept of God, that God is just and God God uh, punishes me uh, if I do wrong, but I haven't done wrong here. And this punishment is way bigger than uh, anything I've, I've done. And so he was really, for most of Job, the book of Job, he was inside that concept of God. Mm -hmm. And then the last four chapters, God just gives him an experience of himself. And Job, at the end of that, kind of goes, oh, okay, 
I, I spoke without understanding, even though I understood you as a concept. Mm. This experience of you has now shaped what I understand to be true about you. And so I've really embraced mm. the part of this where I know that I'm forming in them an approximation mm. of who they will find God to be in their life. Mm. And man, there's days I do that well, and then there's days that I, as you know, as a, as a dad, we just we completely trip and fall. Yeah. Is it fair to say then, Chad, and to, to say that our God concept is kind of like what we say religion, and our God image is kind of like our relationship yeah, with God, and absolutely. we want to shape both of those things, but yep. this is where we want to land in yeah. some sense. Yeah. Th this isn't the cast aside concept. This is simply to say that we also have to take seriously, because think about it, if we try to grow spiritually, right. and we just, all we do is pay attention to concept, right. while ignoring our own image of God. Um, I mean, we all had the experience where we know so much and still we are s still caught in so much sin. Right. Um, I think some of that stuff, the, the roots of some of that stuff are, are found inside of, of our awareness of concept, or uh, awareness of image rather than concept. All right, thanks, Chad. Okay, yeah. we're gonna call a time out here. All right, we're gonna invite our worship team to lead us in a reflection, and we're gonna ask you guys to text in questions, social media in questions, DM us questions if you want, and we are gonna answer those questions after the song. All right, Chad, we're gonna answer a few questions. Okay. Awesome. Here we go. Here's our first question, Chad. You mentioned that you weren't close to your dad in a lot of ways, and that you left, and that left some gaps. How did you go about filling those gaps? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I, I had a lot of therapy, number one. Uh, that was a really healing and uh, le led me to more self-awareness yeah. about issues of image, God image, that I was projecting onto God as if he was my parents in some ways. And so therapy journey was really helpful for that. But two, there's, there's sort of like a composite approach of uh, of of getting this back and filling those gaps, there are a handful of adults that have come into my life, both men and women, who have really, I'm gonna say this in a very general way, fathered me. Mm. Uh, and it's happened for men and women, so it's not particular to one another. Just the, the notion of being guided by people mm. uh, in a way that was life-giving. And, uh, and of course, leaning into that voice of God and when those tears are coming and when I'm feeling like, oh my gosh, you know me so well, mm. I'm not accustomed to this, to not run in those moments, but to lean into those moments. Okay, tell me more. Uh, I think this is something that seems to matter to you. So it's embracing some of those um, uh, things that God is, as he's approaching me in those ways, and he's giving me people. Uh, my therapist, Keith Dowds, uh, in grad school, we had famously uh, the program that we went to. Yeah. Famously, you had to do 25 hours of therapy. So that's just 25 sessions of therapy. And 25, that's half of a year. And that quickly, for me, just extended to five years. It was like, wow, mm -hmm. I'm in, I need this. This is something that's important to me. And Keith, my therapist, was this guy who I still to this day um, say when I'm trying to sink in into prayer and when I'm trying to connect, connect with God, yeah. not just like, hey, this is generally true about you, but when, I, when I'm seeking God's connection yeah. and I'm listening for his voice, yeah. Oftentimes I say, like, I say to myself, this is more like talking to Keith than anybody I've ever talked to. Hmm. This is more like talking to Keith than anybody I've ever talked to. And, and as I start to feel what that feels like again, I'm invited into prayer in a fresh way. And so I would just encourage people who identify with some of those things to embrace and to pursue the relationships that are there in your life uh, don't diminish them. They're significant. They can heal so much. Um, and to understand that God is really reaching out to you through people like that. And it, it can be more of a, a conglomerate or a composite approach. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thanks, Chad. Here's another question. You talked about the idea of a God concept versus a God image. How did you go about changing your God image? Yeah. Yeah, your God image is really, really sticky. It's, it's embedded in there. And right. so, um, like I mentioned, therapy was a huge part of that. Spiritual direction was a huge part of that because what spiritual direction is, is you sitting with somebody else and they are 100% committed to you hearing the voice of God. 
Mm. And so if you say something like, oh, I just feel like God is really judging me, because that's what you do because you had judgmental caregivers at some point, a, a spiritual director can go, okay, so it's interesting you say that because we know that God is not that way. Mm. And so interesting, why don't you push through that and stick with those things until you hear what is the Bible tells us is true about God. And uh, spiritual direction has been huge in that regard, uh, mm. therapy. And again, these relationships, I, I do, like I said about Keith, I have to sit there sometimes and go, God, I, I want to set this time aside. I want to meet with you. Yeah. You are more like these healthy people. You are not the way I'm afraid you are. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, uh, that voice, that first voice in our head that's telling us that we're likely not doing a good enough job that's not the way God grows us, I've come to understand. Mm. He, he's not growing us through shame. Mm. And, uh, and I think that there's a, a huge thing for us to learn there. And now our God concept tells us that. But to, to have more experiences of people uh, and that concept have been really huge for me to sort of fill that gap in and to lean into the people who are, who are loving me in, in ways that are closer to the way God loves me. Great, great. Here's another question. What resources does Biola have for students Spiritual formation. What does this look like? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, and that's a great question. Thanks for asking, because a lot of our jobs as campus pastors yeah. is really connecting people to those resources. Uh, if, if people come to see us, uh, sometimes they feel like, yeah, this is great. You can sit with us, and I can, I can be a kinder voice than is the one in your head about who God is uh, in pastoral care settings. But then also we can connect you guys to resources like the counseling center or spiritual direction. Um, uh, there, there's, there's a whole list of things. I would also encourage you to, my uh, kids are in eighth grade, sixth grade, and third grade, and I'm telling them as they're struggling with their homework, I'm like, listen, uh, lean into your teachers. Go to your, uh, and I would say this to you, go to your professors. Try to have a relationship with them. It's, it's okay if they're busy. Just move toward them in your time here because they are life-giving uh, voices, too, that can kind of change the way we hear God's voice. And for you, my prayer is that, like, you'd have somebody at the end of the day who you go, it's more like talking to my professor. It's more like talking to that campus pastor. It's more like talking to my spiritual director or my therapist. And then you can commence that, that prayer time. That's good. That's good. Thanks. Here's another question. What would you say is the best way to differentiate from your heavenly father and earthly father especially yeah. considering the limitations of your earthly father? Mm, that's a good question. My first admission is that it, that takes a lot of time. Yeah. And so be okay if you walk out of here and you haven't gotten on top of that one. Yeah. You know, it's going to take time, years, decades, Completely. perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then you go in and out of it, too. Yeah. So you get it straight, and then you lose it for a while, and then you get it back. And then, and then God, God is, it seems like there's seasons where God says, we'll lay low on this issue for a while. Mm. And then other times God goes, okay, it's, it's time. We're going we're gonna to really dial that up. Uh, so be okay with the amount of time that that's going to take. Mm. Uh, I would also say, though, that uh, when it comes to, uh, this is where I think God concept helps. Yeah. Uh, our, our Bible minors help us here. Yes. The more you confront yourself with the reality that God is not the way you think he is when you first go into prayer, right. um, that he is loving, he's gracious, he's kind, that his love particularizes you. Like I've, I've said that now, God's love particularizes you, which means God's love draws out your unique gifting and is trying to grow the you that he created you to be. Now I've just told that to you. Now you all have to wrestle with whether or not that's true. And as you wrestle with that being true or not true, uh, it, it, it perhaps would be really good for you to put those questions. God, that guy said that you, you were this way. Um, can you confirm or deny that? Mm. And then let the Holy Spirit lead that process. Um, mm. But I, I think that's why one of the gifts of being a Biola is that we are grooming this really beautiful God concept. Mm. But that, that's tricky to make that concept become the same as our image, and that's going to be a lifelong journey for okay. sure. Okay. Here's another question. I love the idea of you preparing your kids to hear and understand the voice of God. When has that gone well, and when has it been a fail? So listen, like any time, 
because I didn't feel particularized. I didn't feel seen as me. I just sort of felt seen as a, as a generality. Right. Uh, anytime I can start a sentence and end and, and fill in the blanks with something particular about each one of my children. Mm. So Avery is my eighth grader, and do you guys remember what it's like to be in eighth grade? Like, that is some crazy stuff, and I've never done, I've never walked with an eighth grader before through their life. And uh, as she attacks her life and as she's trying to grow and compensate and cope with everything that's being thrown at her, uh, you know what, I, it's so good for me, and I think life-giving to her, is I can say, anything I can say with this preamble, you know, Avery, you know what I know about you? It doesn't matter what I say after that, mm. because I am seeking my hardest to try to say, hey, listen, I paid attention to you, to who you are, what you're made of, I, I, and I want to help you see who you are, and I want you to get an experience of being seen as someone that's particular. Yeah. And so really anytime I can say, hey, Noel, hey, Grant, you know what I know about you? And you know, when I say that too, they're always like, huh, what? Dad knows me. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a, okay, tell me. And it's almost like I'm putting that into them, but I really have to be a student of them to know that. And so there's times that it goes well, but I was telling Noreen in the back earlier, there are times when it goes bad. And I am not just being self-deprecating and kind of like cool humble. <laughs> <laughs> like there are things that I have done that my kids will have to unpack in therapy for years. Right. And, and, and I, so when I, when I interact with you guys and you guys tell me stories about how perhaps your parents have hurt you at times, there's, there's a growing compassion in there mm. for your parents in that because I see how difficult it is and how easy it is to do that. Um, I, I, if you know the Enneagram, I'm an eight, which means in unhealth, I am uh, a, a rager, I have anger. <laughs> and so that's in the anger triad. And so my kids unfortunately have seen and felt the full front uh, of my hurricane of anger. And that just hurts them. And so when it comes time to, for them to go, what's God like? Perhaps God has a hair trigger for them. You know, if I come home from a long day of work and it's just, I'm not feeling it and they're just not listening to me. Yeah. Uh, they've experienced that anger and it's humbling and m my best strategy is when they come to me and say, dad, you were angry, mm. is for me to just go, yeah, I'm sorry. I've been on my own journey and I recognize it in the moment and words came out of my mouth that I wish I could put back in and I know I can't put that toothpaste back in the tube and I'm sorry, uh, will you forgive me? Uh, rather than being defensive in those moments, I, I, I hope I've got something in me that at least there in some far off distant day they can go, I can say, I I'm, I'm so sorry, will you forgive me for that? Mm. And then not like, but it was because you were, no, no. Mm. I'm sorry. You know, and I'm kind of betting on that strategy right now, uh, long term. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I know I appreciate your humility in that too, yeah. Here's another question. How has being a father shaped hmm. how you reach out to college students? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, quite honestly, I think I want to embrace the reality that my posture here with students can hopefully contribute to a new and deepening God image that's more accurate to the concept. Mm. I, I hope. And at times if I, you know, have been aloof or not responded to somebody's in need the right way, those are ways I'm possibly taking away. But I, I think I do embrace a little bit like with, with my job um, some responsibility for acknowledging that I can at least begin to offset or perhaps I can, the way I talk about God can hopefully reshape the image and their experience of God. And so I think, because uh, I've seen it work with my children to some degree, and I think I take some responsibility for that here, which is why this is kind of, for me, more than, a, than just a job. You know, I've worked just a job before. Right. But there's something about this that um, I think is really powerful, and hopefully I can contribute to that. Okay, great. Here's another question. Or not. 
Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. How do I, as a college student at Biola, balance my Bible classes, homework, and my personal study with God? Aren't they the same thing? As long as I'm reading the Bible, right? <laughs> Have you all heard the phrase, uh, um, it's, been, it's, being, it's been said for 25 years at least, because I've been around here for 25 years, that when I was, before I came here, the Bible was like devotional, and now it's just a textbook. Right. And that's kind of a universal experience. I would say, under, listen, understand in your busyness, in your recreational time, in your rest time, in your sin time, <laughs> in your um, praising God time, God is, God is with you. He is, sees you. He's particularizing you. He, he loves you. I'm not talking concept right now. Mm. I'm talking image. And so... Uh, to, to understand that even in your sin, you are loved. I, I don't know if we would distinguish like, okay, so I'm studying right now and I got to balance and then I got to do some time with God to balance out the study. He's in all of that with mm. you. He's, he's present with every ounce of it. And so um, my prayer for you would be that you develop eyes and ears to see and hear that. Great. Love that. Here's another question, Chad. It can be frustrating when I don't see God in my day-to-day -day life. Can you explain what you mean by our experience hmm. of God? Yeah, uh, maybe for all of us, we could just together become a little bit suspect of that first voice we hear in our head. Like, check it a little bit. Um, I, I think of the things that I want to accomplish in a day. And if I don't get to my list of things that I want to do, because I can procrastinate or because I know that I have a history of putting things off, I, I can get to the end of a day and just walk away from work and be like, you are, you are the worst. Mm. You are the worst. And if I don't check that and go, wait a second, God, is that, is that your particularizing love of me? Mm. No, that's not. Oh, okay, back up, back up, back up. I, I'm probably not the worst. God, what would you say about who I am? I think oftentimes we just accept that first voice. Hmm. And it's, we, we are uncritical of that first voice. And I would just invite us to perhaps just pause, take it in, and allow it to um, be checked and run that through our lens of the concept of God that we're learning about in Scripture because that's going to be our plumb line every time. And it, it's like, where would I find in the Scripture I'm the worst? I just, I would never find that. Hmm. Great, great. Here's another question, Chad. Do you have a funny experience of being a father that impacted how you thought of God's mm. love of you. Has to be funny. Well, okay, no pressure. so my son is 11, and Grant is literally, I'm, I'm kind of like a big, loud uh, personality. No way. Yes. I've never thought that. I know that. it's gonna shock you. <laughs> and, uh, and Grant is learning how to have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I can just tell this kid is just watching me and he's watching how I'm constructing jokes or punchlines and things like that as I interact. And uh, he frequently says, Dad, I was about to say that exact same thing. And I'm like, you're learning, my young Padawan. <laughs> and uh, he said uh, the other day he was telling me a story about he went to a birthday party where he was, it was a paintballing uh, birthday party. And it was all guys, but then his friend who had the party, his cousin was a girl. And he has almost no experience with romance or anything. And so he's recounting what the experience of paintballing was. And he keeps bringing up this girl's name like seven times in the story. Nobody else's name comes up. <laughs> and so I let that moment pass a little bit. And I go, hey, dude, you know how like sometimes you say to me that we have the same mind, that we're, you were about to say what I was going to say? I said, I have a question for you that I want to ask, <laughs> and I wonder if you know what the question I want to ask is. And he goes, are you going to ask me about Taylor? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes, I was. And he says, I said, is there anything you want to tell me? And so it was really amazing to see that he's like, he was kind of setting, teeing me up a little bit, and yeah. he's, he's tracking with that, and he's learning. And I just love that because he's recognizing that in his life, I am seeking to know him as best I can, mm. even when I build something up in him and then break it with my temper. He still recognizes I'm pursuing him, and he's, he's acknowledging that. And I just, 
that makes me so happy. Great, great, Chad. So we end the Biola Hour every time by asking what biblical principles have influenced mm. your thoughts for today. Yeah. The, the baptism of Jesus has to become central yeah. for me. Because what was happening was Jesus was about to start the most grueling, difficult journey anybody has ever done. Not only was he about to go out into the desert, be alone, be sustained, he was about to start this redemptive three-year journey in history and bring all of creation back from the brink of destruction. Mm. And he was going to accept all of that and, uh, on his shoulders. And so, to me, it is so significant that in all the interactions we see Jesus having, he, he had within his, within his chest some acknowledgement of who he was and that it was secure because his father said he was okay. Mm. That all the judging eyes, all the people who could make a claim about who I am, he was able to disregard all of it mm. because he had secure the endorsement of his father. This is my son, mm. and I am pleased with him. And I see everything that falls out of his ministry after that would have been, that is a deep well I see him drawing off of, and he would have checked in every day. Lord, is it still true? Father, is it still true? Father, is it still true? Mm. And, and I see him drawing from that well. I mean, how else are you going to do the things that he did? And so that to this day, I, I might even tell, I, when I dropped Grant off this morning, I just said, hey, you please me. You know, mm. you please me. And just so go take that into that grueling meat grinder of a junior high, you know. <laughs> take that I am pleased with you into that setting because you're going to need it. And mm. um, that affects so much of how I approach this. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.